Hello, bonjour, buenos dias, guten tag. Welcome to this FIFA press conference following the outcome of the latest FIFA Council meeting. Uh, appropriately enough, it lasted around 90 minutes, was held uh, via video conference and a number of important talking points in the game. Uh, in terms of helping our interpreters, if I could ask you on the media, please, to raise your hand as soon as possible. We will try to get through as many of you as possible uh, in the next 45 minutes minutes or so. So a respectful plea from me, please to try to keep your questions as brief and succinct and to the point as possible so I can try to get as many of you as possible uh, asking Gianni Infantino your questions. Uh, on the issue of interpretation, the channels, Channel 1 for English, Channel 2 for French, Channel 3 for Spanish, Channel 4 for German and um, the other channel for Arabic. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll hand over to the FIFA president, who's going to say some opening remarks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Also from my side, of course. Hello, uh, guten tag, bonjour, buenos dias, buongiorno, salam aleikum. I need to put a few more than you, so it sounds uh, more global, which is which is what we are. Thanks for uh, joining this. Uh, conference, this press conference, this media conference. It's always a pleasure, uh, even though I cannot see you, but hopefully soon again we can, we can meet in uh, uh, person as well. Uh, at the outset, maybe first a couple of um, uh, discussions, decisions that were taken today by uh, the Council. Well, the first one is that uh, the Council endorsed um, a meeting, a global summit meeting to take place uh, virtually on the 20th of uh, December of this year with the aim of presenting uh, a proposal, a joint proposal, uh, uh, an agreed proposal to all 211 FIFA member associations on the future of football, men's football, women's football and youth football, so 20th of December. Um, also, uh, it was decided that the Club World Cup 2021 will be played in early 22. The precise dates are still to be defined, and uh, but the host following the withdrawal of Japan because of the pandemic, the host will be the United Arab Emirates, UAE, who have hosted this event already a few times, as you know. And uh, also we decided that the Congress, the FIFA Congress uh, uh, next year should be held on the 31st of March um, in uh, Doha uh, on the eve of uh, uh, the draw for the World Cup final tournament. So Qatar will be hosting not only the World Cup, and not only the draw, as always, but also, obviously, as well, the Congress of 2021, 31st of March. Uh, let me just also give you a brief update on uh, um, some of the discussions uh, of today and in the recent days and, and weeks. Obviously, football is a very passionate game. Passion on the pitch, but also passion off the pitch. And uh, what is important for me, what is important for FIFA, is that uh, we care only about what is right for the global game. We want to make football truly global. And in this respect, I want to highlight once again that uh, everybody is equal. We are speaking often about discrimination. For us, everybody is equal. We have 211 member associations. They are all equal and they all must be listened to, obviously. And my role is exactly to listen to everyone, to listen to every side, to give a voice as well to those who are never heard, uh, because uh, this is crucially important, especially when we discuss about the future of uh, our game. Now, I'm obviously aware that uh, the discussions around uh, the new football calendars, around the World Cups and so on, have uh, uh, provoked some strong reactions. I've heard many 
critical and negative comments. I've heard many enthusiastic and positive comments as well. The debate and the discussion is completely different in different parts of the world. And my objective and my task as FIFA president is to try to bring everyone together, to listen to everyone and then to try to bring everyone together. And we must come together because we are speaking here about the global game, about the game that is loved by billions of people all over the world. So I have to say that I'm encouraged by this uh, debate. I think it is a healthy debate. It is something that uh, many of you and many of us were very critical a few years ago in the culture of FIFA. A few years ago, you could not have imagined people having the right to speak up, having the right to bring their opinion and their position. We cleaned FIFA from a governance point of view to a level that uh, the Department of Justice of the United States of America gave us back in a remission 201 million US dollars. Go and ask companies, not only in Switzerland, but probably all over the world, who had issues with the justice system of the United States of America, if they have ever received something like that as a testimony of how the trust in the governance of the new FIFA is completely restored. So we have done that. Now we are in a phase which is about the democratic functioning of FIFA. And this is also a learning process for an organization like FIFA who is not used to democratic processes, who is not used to debate. But the culture of debate, the culture of discussion, the culture of bringing ideas together, which goes also with heated <coughs> debates and discussions, is something that we are going through now, but for the benefit of the future. This is not about FIFA or about the World Cup. This is about our children. This is about how we can make sure that we take our responsibility as leaders of football organizations seriously by looking into the future, not by protecting the present, by looking into the future, by making sure that our children and the children of our children will continue to fall in love with the game that we all love. And we know that there are challenges in today's world. The young generation has many, many other things that they are focusing on. And football is risking to lose its appeal. And that is what we are discussing about here. And that is why this process of having a global consultation, of letting everyone speak, of giving everyone the possibility to express themselves is so important for us. We are here to lead. We are here to guide football on a global scale from now into the future. When it comes uh, to the international match calendar, a bit more specifically, and when we speak about the international match calendar, we speak about this balance between national team games and club games, which is, of course, very crucial and which has changed in the last couple of decades. I call everybody, and we have, I think, and I believe, also following the meeting of today, a common viewpoint from everybody to work together for the good of the game, something which maybe has been forgotten. We must rethink the way in which global football is structured. We must improve the quality of global football. 
we have to see if it's possible to organize more meaningful competitions for the fans, for the fans, because we are all fans, without adding additional dates to the current match count. And it's the sporting motivations that are guiding us, not the financial motivations, the sporting motivations. So we speak about football, not about revenues. We will have to speak as well about revenues, obviously, and about investment of these revenues into the world of football. But first, we want to do what is right for football. And in this respect, I'm very grateful to um, Jill Ellis and Arsene Wenger, who are leading this process. This is how we launched the process, asking football people what they think from a football perspective. And they, come up, they came up with ideas which we put on the table to open the debate, to consult, not to ask people to be in favor or against, but to debate, to discuss, to consult. And ultimately, when everyone had the chance to listen to everyone, when we had the chance to analyze all the legitimate questions that are being raised, to come, of course, to a conclusion for the future. We have this opportunity. This opportunity is now because the international match calendars for women and men are coming to an end next year and the year after. We must take this opportunity. It's not, an opportunity. It's not only an opportunity. It is also our responsibility. And we want to do this with everyone on board. Um, with this and with the, with the remarks I made earlier about uh, the other decisions taken, um, I pass the floor to you, Brian. Thank you very much indeed, Gianni. Okay, time for your questions now. We will start uh, with Marca in Spain, Jose Felix Diaz. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Gianni, I have a question, a direct question to you. Would it be is it going to be possible to reach an agreement? Of course. Can you can you please explain? Of course it is possible to reach an agreement. And in fact, that must be our main objective, the main objective for FIFA and for FIFA's president, to reach a consensus. It is really important to listen to all the questions, legitimate questions, of course, about the impact this will have on the calendar, the financial impact, the impact on football, and to see how we can adjust the proposals that have been made. Because up to now, we have not asked anybody to agree with the suggestions, with the proposals. We have just presented them so that we can start a conversation. So I personally do believe that we can agree, we can reach an agreement, we can reach an, a consensus. Because what I've said from the beginning, particularly from my point of view, is that we're going to change things only if we are completely convinced that it will be beneficial for everybody. For everybody. And if it's beneficial for everybody, I cannot see how anybody would not agree to it. Of course, we must show, we must prove that, in fact, these suggestions and proposals are indeed beneficial for everybody. The second question goes to the nation in Nigeria, Morakinio Abodun Rin. My name is Morakinio Abodun of the Nation Newspaper in Nigeria. I would like to ask the FIFA president, uh, how will a final World Cup, for instance, be beneficial to Africa, knowing the kind of peculiar circumstances of the continent? 
Thanks. Thanks for your question. Well, I think that, um, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, to Africa in particular, uh, there is a, a huge passion for the game. Um, there is an incredible talent for the game. And uh, I believe that uh, with the right structure and infrastructure, um, football in Africa will grow immensely and Africa is definitely on the right track in this respect with the new CAF leadership as well. Um, and it's clear as well that uh, uh, a World Cup in Africa, a youth World Cup, a women's World Cup or a men's World Cup, co-hosted maybe by some African countries in the future, would um, definitely help in terms of uh, the football development in the continent, the enthusiasm that it creates would unite the continent behind a dream, behind a vision. Uh, it would have a positive, very positive impact, obviously, on all the infrastructures related to a World Cup, not only stadiums, but also airports, hotels. It would have the, or bring the opportunity to present Africa to the world in a new way, not for uh, any sort of uh, tragic news or uh, bad news or uh, news that people have to feel sad about or for some charity questions, but for some real top professional activities that can, of course, be carried out in Africa as well as in other parts of the world. So um, I strongly encourage uh, African associations, African governments to think about putting forward bids to organize World Cups because there is nothing that unites the world such as a World Cup. So uh, from that perspective, uh, we would certainly love to go to Africa for a World Cup, but we love to go anywhere in the world as well. Thank you for your question, Morakinio. Next question, please, to the Associated Press and Rob Harris. Rob, all yours. Uh, hello, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Hello. Hi, Rob. Hi. Um, just a couple of questions. Are you planning a full feasibility study financially, logistically, on biennial World Cups? And could that be the ultimate deal breaker? Would you give up on the biennial World Cup if it didn't prove to be financially beneficial, if anyone was worse off uh, from that? And you've got the whole of Europe, much of Europe seemingly opposed. So would you really go ahead with this if they do carry out their threat of a boycott of the World Cup and... Uh, uh, and, and, and they push it to the brink like that. When would you go against Europe when they're so determined they do not want my annual World Cup? Well, thanks. Thanks for the questions. And uh, uh, yes, obviously, uh, the feasibility study that we are undertaking uh, has started with uh, the football element. I remember some years ago we were criticised for thinking about uh, the money uh, before thinking about the football, uh, which was not true at that time. But it doesn't matter. Uh, this time, we wanted to. Uh, certainly reverse uh, anyway the, uh, um, the process starting with the football side. And that's why we asked Jill Ellis and Arsene Wenger to come up uh, with proposals based on requests that, um, that we received. And I think this is also something that should be uh, underlined and highlighted. 166 associations, 88% voted in favour, including a majority, of course, of, of Europeans and of others have asked us to do this feasibility study. Uh, that's why it is our task and our duty to do it. We don't have yet the outcome. That's why it's uh, premature on the financial side. That's why it's premature uh, to speak about it. What I can assure you is that uh, we would go ahead only if everyone is, is better off. And I believe that if everyone is better off, whether it's with World Cups every two years, whether it's only men or only women, whether it's with something else, uh, if everyone is better off, not only economically, but also sportingly, with the participation and so on, I think uh, that uh, there is a chance to come uh, to a 
global uh, consensus. This is my objective. This is also my task. I'm here to unite. I'm not here to uh, divide. Uh, it's not always easy to be president of FIFA, uh, especially it's not easy in this particular context where people have been given the opportunity to uh, speak and where they speak. So the question of the World Cup every two years, if this is your question, is not something that will just go away like that. It's not dependent on the FIFA president. It's dependent on those who want this or something else in order to develop their game. And we all have, and there, there is a consensus of everyone, we all have the responsibility to work in, um, in trying to make the game better all over the world. And let's not forget as well that uh, every sports organization uh, has uh, in the past taken opportunities to develop their competitions. Uh, most of them have added games, have added hundreds of games, and that's legitimate if it's good for the game. FIFA is going through exactly this process now. Uh, it was not done maybe when it should have been done. And again, it's not about the World Cup, it's about the global football ecosystem and how we can make sure that we can attract uh, mainly our youth back into football. So I am, well, as you know me, positive by nature. I uh, believe uh, that we can come up with something that makes sense and something that everyone um, can be happy. And I understand as well all critical voices on one side as on the other side uh, uh, trying to uh, find a bridge between all these different positions is our challenge, but is also our ambition. Thanks for your question, Rob. We'll now go to Chile and Publimetro and Pablo Vargas. Pablo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. The president has just been in South America and you've been in Chile as well. You said that Chile, together with other countries from the region, might organize their World Cup in 2030. What has been the reaction in other countries in the region, such as Argentina? Because Argentina at some point said that would be interested. I would like to know is if South America indeed has the chance to get the World Cup in 2030 with a joint bid with other countries. Brazil is obviously a different category in South America because it's such a, such a big country. But the other countries could maybe submit a joint bid to organize the World Cup. Do you think maybe it will be easier if we organize a World Cup every two years? Thank you so much for your question. Indeed, I was in South America last week and it was a very interesting trip. We had very interesting discussions with federal associations and I've seen that the associations are doing a great, are doing great work. People are very enthusiastic and, of course, everybody wants to do more and more. Obviously, the World Cup is the most relevant competition. It's the biggest competition, the biggest event on Earth. And, indeed, South American, several South American countries would like to organize a World Cup. We talked about it, obviously. I myself, as FIFA president, am very happy to hear that South America would be interested in organizing a World Cup. I always say this, and it's the truth. There's so much passion in South America for football. It's incredible. And I think that everybody, 
I definitely, I definitely do, and I think everybody would like to see a new World Cup in South America. You've mentioned Brazil, and I think World Cups organized in one single country are probably a thing of the past. I think probably we'll see more World Cups organized by two or three different countries. If we do so, every region in the world, including South America, can not only dream, but really plan, plan to organize a World Cup. I am also very happy, I must say, to see that so many countries are interested in organizing a World Cup. Men World Cup and Women World Cup. FIFA had lost the trust of um, many people, governments, organizations, etc. Due to the procedures and the organization of, of FIFA. But I think in recent years we have shown what we can do and what we can guarantee to South American people and to everybody else in the world. We can assure you that the procedures to organize a World Cup are going to be professional, transparent and, of course, based on fair play. Thank you. Vorman from Stuff in New Zealand. Uh, given the time difference, he has submitted his question in advance. Uh, not unreasonably, I think he's still in bed. Uh, he asks, Jani, what opportunities will the new match calendar allow for Oceania teams to play matches against teams from other confederations outside of World Cups, something that is important for their growth? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think that's, that's indeed an important uh, uh, point, and, and we have uh, been listening to uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some persons in, uh, in New Zealand and, and Oceania uh, and Australia, which geographically is also um, far away from, uh, from Europe. And, and it, is, it, is really, it is really a challenge for uh, those players uh, who play uh, maybe in European leagues, who have to travel uh, when they have the nine-day window uh, to uh, the other part of the world with time difference, uh, with everything. I mean, uh, it is a big, big challenge, and we have to look at uh, the calendar because uh, whether these players play or not with the national team, that is 20 percent of their time, 80 percent of their time, they are they are with clubs. Uh, and we want them to be able to play in the best clubs as well, but also to represent their national team in a decent, uh, not only decent, but actually in the best possible um, way. So when we look at the international match calendar, at the windows, at maybe the competition structures, because that will be part of the discussions we will have to have in each continent with each confederation and the relevant associations, how they want to do their qualification stages, how they want to do other competitions that they have in the future to give opportunities, of course, uh, to meet. Uh, but it's important as well that uh, the top teams uh, have the opportunity uh, to meet, actually not only the top teams, but also the others, to meet at the intercontinental level more regularly in competitive games. It's not the same as, as friendly games as we know so we need to find there the right uh, uh, compromise and uh, we are discussing about these topics precisely as well with all different confederations thanks very much uh, indeed for your question andrew we can now go to reuters and simon evans simon all yours Hi, Johnny. Uh, first question, just, just to be clear on this uh, global summit on December 20th, will there actually be a vote on these proposals at that meeting? Will it be a binding vote? I mean, it's not an extraordinary congress, but will it have a vote? That's my first question. And your second? <laughs> the second question is, okay, to we'll do it that way, yeah. No, the no, it's okay, I can have be, whatever. <laughs> no, I mean... With, I mean, it's, it's, it's been quite a hostile debate, hasn't it? And, and, and often we've seen this in the past in football governance, that when there are these hostile debates, in the end there's some sort of compromise found. 
Are you willing to, to find a compromise? Is there something there? We've heard ideas like Global Nations League as an alternative or kind of a B World Cup, a secondary tournament for teams that don't make the World Cup. Are these things that you are considering or does it have to be the World Cup every two years or the status quo? Actually, it's a World Cup every year because we are speaking about the men's and the women's uh, World Cup, so we are speaking about the World Cup every year. <laughs> but besides, besides that, um, the, debate it, the debate has been and, and probably will continue uh, to be uh, heated, I hope not too heated, and I hope it remains always, how should I say, uh, respectful, right, and, uh, and, and positive, because first we are speaking about football and not about you know, some tragedies around the world. We have enough of tragedies already. And secondly, because we are here in good faith, in good faith, to work very, very hard to try to do something which is good for football. Now, I understand, being a passionate myself about football, that uh, uh, you can have different opinions and you can bring the passion out of it as well. I'm confident that on the 20th of December we will be able, and it was the aim that I expressed to the Council and it was supported by all the Council members, uh, that by the 20th of, of December we can present a common solution. How this will look like, for me, everything is open. But as I said, it's not my proposal or my decision. I have to facilitate the dialogue. I have to bring people together. I have to make changes that benefit everyone. This is my job and my task. I have my views and my opinions, obviously. Uh, but more important than my opinions and my views is what football and the world of football thinks should be done. And I believe that in working together, we'll come out with something uh, positive. And maybe it's a stage process, and, and maybe we make one step further, and one, one step forward, and then a step back, or a half a step, or two steps. We have to see, uh, because I understand as well that it is very, very difficult for people to change, even, and especially things that have been the same for the last 100 years. I understand that uh, everyone has his own interests that he or she wants to defend and uh, I'm just calling everyone to be uh, uh, you know calm and rational about uh, um, about it uh, having trust of course in uh, um, in the process and I hope we can present really a joint position um, on the 20th of, uh, of December and we will work hard all of us together to reach this, uh, this position. How it will look like? Well, we will see. We have received some, as I said, legitimate uh, uh, criticism. We have received a lot of enthusiastic comments as well. When you're in the middle of all of that, uh, you know, it's a bit like, a, like, I don't know, like a referee when there is a riot going on in, in a match. So you have to try to, to calm down and have a few people as well who are helping you. Uh, to bring reason uh, to the people. What I can assure is of our uh, goodwill to, uh, uh, to look into every potential proposal because our aim is to make football better and that should be the aim of everyone in FIFA. Thanks for your question or questions, Simon. We can go over to Japan now. Hideo Tamaru from Kyoto News. The floor is yours. Uh, can, you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Hi, yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the Olympics. And obviously, if the biennial World Cup is going to happen, it will clash with the Summer Olympics. So is there any actual discussion about actually pulling out of the Olympics or perhaps changing the category to futsal or beach soccer? <laughs> no, certainly not. Certainly not. We're not... We are not uh discussing or threatening or whatever to pull out of the Olympics on the contrary uh, uh, I think that football is a, is a proud part of the Olympic movement and uh, um, you know and uh, part of our reflections is obviously as well how to protect uh, sport in general and I believe um, that uh, when we speak about sport, uh, if we do something which is good for football, it's actually good for sports generally. 
because uh, if we can bring people to football, well, that's obviously our main objective at FIFA. Um, but the important is to bring young people in particular and also older ones to practice, to practice sport. And one of the issues that has our society today is uh, the lack of uh, young men and women, boys and girls, practicing sport. Because they have many, many other things to do. It's not like we are not that old, but uh, in our young days, uh, you didn't have many other things to do than uh, taking a ball and, uh, or going to somebody who had the ball, actually, and, and, and try to kick around as good as, as you can. Um, today, the young generation has many, many other things to do. So I believe that um, um, we should uh, be able to attract positivity for anything that makes football better because it makes sports better. And we should all care about sports. We shouldn't care about our own little uh, territory. We have to care about the whole picture, the IOC, is definitely doing that, and, uh, and I can assure you that we are doing that um, as well. Thank you very much for your question. We can now go to Wolfgang Müller from DPA in Germany. Wolfgang. Hello, schönen guten Tag aus Berlin. Hello from Berlin. I would like to ask a question that uh, is linked to the questions that you already received from other agencies. You said that the discussions are quite heated. A number of European associations have threatened to leave FIFA. To what extent is this a realistic threat? And how were you able to deal with these tensions? answer. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thank you very much. Well, as I already said, the discussions were heated. That is true. And that is probably normal. And it may be due to the fact that we're not used to actually being able to discuss these subjects. You come from Germany. I don't know to what extent the German association actually contributed to a discussion to the, with regard to the international match calendar. That was simply a topic where nobody was ever consulted for. And because of that, it is so important for everyone to actually be able to voice their opinion and to make their voice heard. It then happens sometimes that that opinion is voiced perhaps more forcefully than initially intended, that threats of boycotting an association are formulated. I can tell you that that was not the case today. The discussions were very positive, and we are actually aiming for a consensus. And I believe that we will be able to reach one, a consensus. My job is to be a moderating force. We have different camps. Some are absolutely for this reform, others are absolutely against it. But what is important is that everybody is entitled to their opinion and to voicing it. And I'm convinced that if we are all ready to work for the good of football, we will also be ready to compromise to a certain extent. That means that we all have to move in the direction of solidarity with global football. Because in the end, if we do that, The good that comes from it is actually positive for everyone. Maybe you're still too young for that, but I still remember when the Champions League 
was created. That was before I worked for UEFA. So that was work done by my predecessors. And at that point in time, a lot of criticism was voiced in all kinds of countries. They said that the Champions League would destroy all of the national leagues and the national markets, and the contrary turned out to be true. The Champions League is an incredible success. The Premier League is still a huge success. The same is true for the Bundesliga in Germany. So what we can take from this is if we work together and if we promote football globally, then the good that comes from it will be there for everyone. Some will perhaps get a bigger slice of the cake. That is true. But we have to find a solution that is good for everyone. That is our aim. Going, let's go now to the New York Times, Tarek Panja. Hi, Tarek. Hi, Brian. Hi, hi Jenny. Hi, Tarek. Can, can I ask, just uh, my, my head's hurting, trying to follow all of this. Yours must be too. Yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned <laughs> consensus here. And the, the point is, you, there is no consensus for a biennial World Cup because UEFA I understand in the meeting yesterday, you had all those European FAs and, and, and uh, the president of UEFA, Sheffer, and he, he, he said he will support, not never support a biennial World Cup, always support uh, a four yearly World Cup. There is no consensus for a biennial World Cup. So is it fair to say there will never be a consensus, so there cannot be a biennial World Cup because you won't get consensus? And my second question, sorry, just on this is about governance. In, in, in 2017, Vitaly Mutko was not allowed to be on the FIFA Council because he was also the Russian sports minister. So under, under FIFA's guidelines on political neutrality, the, the governance committee, funny enough, um, Pauzi Lecture of Morocco sat on the governance committee at the time. He's now been appointed to the Moroccan cabinet by the king. He's now a member of the Moroccan government. Does that mean he can no longer be on the FIFA Council based on your own rules and based on what happened to Mr. Monko? I've been trying to find out for a week, but I haven't been able to get an answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, on, on, um, on your first question, as, as I said, and I can, I can just repeat, uh, we want to try to reach a consensus. How this consensus will look like, uh, well, we will see. You know, we, we have not yet asked anyone to say uh, if they are in favor or against. We've taken, of course, note. I've taken note. Everyone has taken note of the position of uh, uh, Europe, of UEFA, uh, of other stakeholders. Uh, there are other stakeholders who, who uh, say only this will, on, only this or nothing else. Uh, other confederations, we want the World Cup every two years or nothing else. Um, you know, if this is the end point, then obviously there will be no consensus. But if this is the starting point, then we have to see how we can uh, approach the different opinions and the different parties. And to do that, we need to do, as FIFA as well, our part of the job. We need to finalize our feasibility study. We need to look at the sporting merits, at uh, the economic merits, and then we can have a reasoned discussion rather than an emotional discussion about World Cups every two years, uh, other types of competitions, uh, what kind of events we can create to make football better and so everyone can benefit. So I don't know what, what the ultimate result will be. We have been asked by the Congress to make a study on uh, a feasibility study on World Cups every two years and, and, and some other matters. That's what we are doing. And at the same time, we englobe and include the feedback of everyone and, and we try to uh, come up with something good. If uh, anyone has a good proposal on what we could do to benefit world football, please, please tell us. Some think that the World Cup every two years is the panacea, is the, the solution to all the problems of world football. Others think it will create or it will destroy or whatever uh, uh, world football. Um, well, maybe there is a, a way we have not yet found, um, but speaking together we can find. So any good proposal, any idea is most, um, um, most welcome. 
On um, um, the second question, I don't remember anymore, what was it? Uh, uh, yes, on, on Mr. Legja, on Fauzi Legja. Well, I, I can just repeat uh, as well there what obviously you know is that, uh, I mean, under our statutes, under FIFA statutes, FIFA is, of course, neutral in matters of politics and uh, religion. We don't express, and FIFA and nor FIFA members exp uh, express any political uh, preferences. And Mr. Legja was uh, uh, at the FIFA Council as well this afternoon. Uh, he participated in the in the debates uh, very actively. So that's what I can say at this stage about this. Thank you very much indeed for your Thank questions, you. Tarek. Let's go now to Simon Stone at the BBC. Simon. Hi, Johnny. I uh, hope you're OK. Um, throughout all the debates, um, I've not heard once sustainability mentioned. If we're talking about World Cups every year, male and female, that's more stadiums, that's more travel, that's more hotels needing to be built. We live in a world where there's a lot of concern about sustainability and how the planet exists. What you're proposing, any of these proposals, how does that fit with the sustainability of this planet? Thanks, uh, Simon. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Simon. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you too. Um, thanks for the question. Very, very, very important uh, topic, sustainability. Uh, as I said before to uh, uh, your African and, and South American colleagues, I think that the time of uh, FIFA, I could speak for other federations as well, but uh, I will speak only for FIFA, uh, asking one country to uh, take up the burden of organizing on its own a World Cup, uh, this time is over. And uh, one of the main reasons why this time is over is exactly because we care about sustainability. Because we care about our planet, because we care about the future, because we know that uh, we can bring through a World Cup joy, unity, also more concretely uh, jobs to more than one country without asking this country to ruin itself in order to organize an event by co-hosting an event in more than one country. Uh, you are from the BBC, right? Yes. The BBC is in the UK, right? Uh, but yeah, it's global, but yeah. It's global, but based uh, in the United Kingdom. So there is an interest, of course, as you know, of uh, uh, the four members of FIFA in the UK, plus the Republic of Ireland, so five countries together who would like maybe uh, at least they, there is uh, there are some discussions uh, host a world cup a men's world cup at some stage i believe that in these five countries um, there is not a huge need of uh, work investment to be done in order to welcome the world for a World Cup. A World Cup with 48 teams is a big event. The next one is organized by three huge countries, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. There will be four million people attending the games. There will be two to three million visitors. Of course, you need infrastructure, hotel rooms, airports, and so on. But that's why we need to share this burden with uh, uh, different countries. Now imagine if uh, the bit uh, of uh, the four UK countries and the Republic of Ireland, so five countries, would be awarded the right to organize the World Cup. And if this fact of having a World Cup, men or women, organized by five neighboring countries, of course, could be a model to follow because it ensures exactly sustainability. So if this would happen, uh, with uh, a World Cup 
men or women every year or another global competition every year, you could have in 20 years 100 countries around the world who could be sharing the burden and the pleasure or the pleasure and the burden of hosting a World Cup. This would leave in all these countries a legacy, an important legacy, without affecting the economy of the country on a negative way, but on the opposite, on a very, very positive way. And this would really be uniting and including and would be very inclusive for the entire world. One second element linked to sustainability is, and maybe you will say, well, uh, or some will say, well, it's not a big deal or whatever. But it is an important element. Uh, all these travels that today uh, football players have to uh, undergo to play for their national team. If you are an Australian playing in England and you have to fly to Australia for a game and then to whatever, uh, uh, Japan for a second game and then back to England and all these elements, all these travels, it, 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 it makes 300, 400,000 kilometers, I don't know how much it is in miles uh, every year, uh, whereas uh, a European player in, for the same number of games has to travel 10 times less. With the proposal we make on the international match calendar, we would also drastically uh, reduce travels, having a positive impact on the health of the players, but obviously also on um, on our planet. Now, how this proposal can be adapted and so on, uh, this is another uh, discussion I was referring to it earlier. But thanks really for the question. This is a crucial topic for us. Thanks so much indeed for your question, Simon. And just on that issue of sustainability, just to reiterate what the President has said there, FIFA uh, offsetting carbon footprint since uh, the 2018 World Cup, very stringent bidding requirements, a uh, key part of deciding hosts. It's something that we obviously care very passionately about and we'll send you more details uh, on our work in terms of sustainability, in terms of ensuring uh, environmentally friendly, recycling carbon neutral uh, and so on. Uh, Conscious of time, two questions to go, please. Let's go over to ESPN Mexico, Omar Flores. Omar, all yours. Hello, good afternoon, President. I have some questions. First one being, we still hear in the football stadiums in this match against Canada, we still hear some um, unsettling remarks. Could Mexico lose their position in the um, World Cup? And is there a deadline to decide how many matches, uh, so many, how, how often the World Cup is going to be held? Well, and the second question, we will try to reach an agreement on the 20th of December. We hope to reach consensus and we will see if it's going to be played every every year, two or three or four years or more. Rather than that, how we are going to rearrange the calendar, the international match calendar. Female calendar finishes in 2023, for male it's 2024, so it is our responsibility to reach an agreement um, soon. For your other question, when there are homophobic um, issues that can be heard in a, in a stadium, the, dis the committee, the discipline committee and the appeal committee for FIFA uh, are in charge of those cases. They are independent committees. And as a president of FIFA, I cannot intervene, I cannot comment specific cases. What I can say is that's absolutely unacceptable that in a field in a stadium, discriminatory, racist, homophobic shouts are heard. What's the education we're giving to our kids? We want families to go to the stadiums. We want kids to go to the stadiums, to watch the matches. 
We want them to enjoy the game, to be passionate about the game. And we go to the stadiums and they have to hear insults to the referees, to the players. That is not acceptable. We have to work very hard educating. As FIFA, we are doing it. We have some projects, very interesting very interesting project, Football for Schools, if you've had any chance to have a look at it. I know that the Mexican Federation Member Association has been doing an amazing work. They are working very hard to eliminate these ridiculous habits and discriminatory habits from the stadiums. There's no room for them in the stadiums. We need to be able to get angry, of course, to celebrate, to cry, to laugh. But we cannot insult others. It's not right. And if you don't want to live in the Stone Age anymore, those who want to evolve, they are very welcome to stay in football. But those of those people who want to stay in that age, oh, please stay out of the football stadiums too, please. Just two questions. Uh, over to Egypt now, Ishmael Mahmoud from Sada El Balat. Good evening. Did I? Sorry. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Lord Cup. Yes, uh, with the calendars of League Continental Championship, could you explain? Could you explain the new system of qualifying to World Cup? No, because uh, because this is part of exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, I, I cannot explain. Yes. I, I cannot explain uh, the 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 system of qualifying for a World Cup in the future. Because this is exactly part of the discussions um, of uh, uh, of what we can do to make football better, of biannual World Cups, of the international match calendar, um, and uh, this will depend on the final decision taken. And uh, uh, one of the points that we are obviously aware as well is that in a World Cup, even with 48 teams, you still have less than 25% of the FIFA member associations who participate in the World Cup. This means more than 75% uh, mm. of the members of FIFA are not participating in the World Cup. And we need to organize football, international football, national team football for all of them. Um, so it is a Im very important element how the qualifications will be structured because that's where all FIFA member associations, all countries participate, uh, whereas in the World Cup only those who qualify do participate. So the qualification systems will be part of the discussions with the confederations and the associations and part of the overall solution uh, to the issues we have on the table. Thanks for your question. Last question now goes to Press Association, Jamie Gardner. Hi, Jamie. Hi there, Brian. Hi, Gianni. Um, Hi, Jamie. I just wanted to, Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask you, on the feasibility study, yeah. uh, whether part of that will seek evidence or market research on the extent to which young people are losing interest in football? Um, because I know I've heard you talk about it before, but I, I guess you'll want to put numbers to that as part of your evidence gathering. Yes, definitely. That will be part of it because that is the main uh, the main trigger uh, for the work we are doing today. Um, it is a, it is a fact, uh, and and we want to bring evidence uh, about that. And it is uh, a fact that uh, is going on for for some time, and we need to uh, you know revert this uh, this tendency by making sure we can propose. Um, something to the fans, in particular to the young fans, which uh, they are interested in. Today, um, there is not just a football game going on on a weekend. There are many other things going on on a weekend. 
and uh, uh, if the football game that is going on on the weekend is not, or also during the week actually, is not uh, a meaningful football game, well then youngsters will probably switch uh, uh, and watch or be interested by something else. <clears throat> so of course the feasibility stu study will look into this particular element as well as into the element of uh, the social uh, economic uh, impact not only in the football ecosystem but more globally in the society as well as what we were saying before about the sustainability and uh, environmental elements which are today extremely important as well so we try to cover uh, a broad range of, of areas in this uh, study and we hope that uh, um, you know we can uh, find some positive reflection following that Thank you very much for your question, Jamie. Thank you, Gianni. Uh, a lot of questions came in. Uh, if you could send your inquiries now to media at fifa.org and we will do our very best to get back to you. Thanks, everyone, for your time, for your interest, wherever you are in the world. Most importantly, stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.